As Australians, we love our environment. We love our way of life. As we enjoy our days, we feel secure that our kids won't unfortunately lose a limb while accidentally playing with a bomb. We needn't fear that we might step on a cluster munition while we explore the backyard. But what if things were different? What if cluster munitions had been dropped on our land? What if 10, 20, 50 years after they were dropped, they remained dormant? Uh, cluster munition is basically a big bomb that's full of lots of little bombs, simplest description. It's either dropped from an aircraft or fired by a rocket or artillery and the, the bomb canister, the main bomb canister will open up in flight and lots of these smaller bomblets, which might be the size of a tennis ball or a D-cell battery or a, a can of drink, um, will then rain down across, um, the, across the target. Now, if you get caught under a cluster strike, you're going to have a very bad time. There's no doubt about that. And militarily, it will kill a lot of people on the ground. The problem from a civilian point of view is massive numbers of the massive percent rates fail to explode when they're dropped, which means they lay around creating a de facto landmine field. The impact of cluster munitions in developing countries is something that can be avoided simply by not using these weapons. There's been a treaty created to uh, stop the use of these weapons, which recognises that uh, they are a large cause of death and disability to civilian populations from unexploded cluster munitions after they're dropped, uh, in particularly in developing countries. And here in a field in southern Lebanon, I'm standing in a, a very small area amongst a mass of M85 cluster munitions and they are all the type with the self-destruct mechanism. Each one of them has failed to explode. Some are armed, some are not armed, but they are all laying about, equally dangerous, ready to blow up the first person who comes into contact with them. In a very small 50 by 50 metre area, we've so far counted up over 20 of them. We'll leave it at that, we'll leave it for the battle area clearance teams to come in and do their job. But it does prove that the concept of self-destruct mechanisms on cluster munitions is just false. People forget about the wars. You know, the, the war in Laos, uh, that America bombed Southeast Asia and Laos in the 1960s and 70s, that war has been over for 37 years. So we're into generations of children that their grandparents were barely alive when that conflict was fought. But they're living with a dangerous de legacy that was created from those years of conflict. Now we're passing into the 10th the year of conflict in um, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. And 
we're creating that dangerous legacy for the, uh, the populations in those countries yet again. We know what the result's going to be when these weapon systems are used. We know exactly what it will do to the civil societies. So why are we having a weapon system to be in continued use where we know it's going to create a humanitarian catastrophe decades after the conflict is over? It's simply unacceptable. It needs to stop. A treaty exists that will ban it. We need people to take this treaty seriously, sign onto it, enshrine the ideals of the treaty in their national legislation, and once and for all, ban cluster bombs. Wars do have limits. The legislation being proposed by the government uh, allows for foreign forces to stockpile and transit cluster munitions across Australian territory. It also allows for uh, cluster munitions to be retained in Australia and it also allows for Australian forces to assist in joint military operations where cluster munitions are going to be used. This goes against everything in the Convention. The purpose behind the Convention is to eliminate cluster munitions and by allowing for retention, by allowing for stockpiling, transit and assistance in the use of cluster munitions, uh, it clearly doesn't meet what is required and clearly goes against the Convention itself. Civil society also put in a lot of submissions and dissected the proposed legislation piece by piece. There's a lot of concerns and very provable concerns with the proposed legislation. The Senate then had a hearing um, which was largely lip service to the process. Though I don't think they took it seriously at all as to what they were doing. Of the six members who were supposed to be on it, three Labor, two Liberal and one Green, uh, the two of the Labor didn't even bother turning up to the Senate inquiry, so they heard none of the arguments from neither civil society nor the Attorney General, nor Defence, nor Foreign Affairs. And the two Liberal Senators left after civil society had been grilled by them, leaving the one Green Senator in the chair. Now, is that a serious way to take on such an a important issue as a major disarmament treaty? That seemed to me to just be dismissive of the entire process. It was interesting to be in the, uh, the hearings and listen to Defence and the Attorney General's department not be able to argument, argue their points. They were getting stumped on simple questions. But still, the, the weight of the treaty of the, uh, the, the Senate Hearing Committee being the two Liberal and the three Labor, have not put in dissenting reports to recommend future changes in the treaty. They're accepting what the Attorney General has said, saying, yep, we're happy with this legislation, pass it as is. That's wrong, because it's not going to bring about an end. It doesn't even attempt to bring about an end on the existence of cluster bombs. One of the stories that really stuck with me, and it was a thing I went out and photographed, was a man who was a fisherman and he realised the, the area around uh, southern Lebanon in Intir was very dangerous so he put his boats out and started fishing thinking that the water was safe and as he pulled his nets in he found a little thing which was not much bigger than a D-cell battery with a fabric loop on the back of it and he went to pull it out of his nets and it detonated and blew off both his hands and his eyes so he's gone from being a 34 year old father of four children and a husband to a handless blind invalid. Now his eyes and his hands will never grow back. That's He is destroyed. Now the family's future is also destroyed. That's absolutely wrong. Another is of uh, three small children in, in Laos and they found a cluster bomb. The type they found looks like a ball. It's about the same size as a tennis ball and they to arm them you spin them and they started playing with it like a ball, picking up and throwing it between them. Two boys and one girl. And as they threw it to the eldest brother, he caught it, the cluster munition detonated, and it blew the upper part of his body off. It just did, did, that disintegrated. The other two children were very badly injured where they were split from basically the sternum down to their navel, and they very nearly died. They were lucky in one sense they did survive, but they will spend the rest of their life with that vision in their head that they killed their brother. They know what it's like to look at their brother being blown to pieces a couple of metres in front of them. Now, that is not an accident, that's just the way these things happen. If you use these munitions, you know that's what's going to happen when you use them. It's unacceptable, it's wrong. And 
That's just a story that gets repeated country after country, day after day, in any place where cluster munitions have been used. If Australia passes this legislation in its, prop, in its current form, it will be the world's weakest legislation. And we will be a laughing stock internationally, and we'll deserve to be a laughing stock internationally. So much for the leadership of the Gillard government to think that they had any sort of moral high ground to be able to lead a country which is as good as Australia and not be able to ban a weapon system that we don't even have, nor do we want. I don't call that leadership.